my name is uh, Hayat Osayran. As um, it says here, I'm a child labor uh, expert for uh, having worked in this field for over 20 years uh, in the Arab region. Um, together, we're just having to, today we're together. We're having a quick look at the situation of uh, child labor in the MENA region, and. Um, Many would think, you know, how are we talking about this issue uh, amidst what's happening now, even these days, of, uh, of coronavirus? Uh, I would like to say that um, natural disasters, in addition to conflict, are a major, major cause of huge uh, uh, numbers uh, going into child labor. So it's, it's conflict, true, that we have been experiencing over the past uh, more than 10 years in uh, the Middle East and uh, North Africa. But also child labor comes as a result of natural disasters. And we are amidst one uh, nowadays. And this will appear more so after uh, the storm is over, really. So uh, the region has witnessed one more after the other and we've been only able to see the direct um, impact of war which is injuries um, deaths sadly enough uh, but and and refugees and displacement but we rarely really see what's happening underneath and how many children are suffering in silence uh, during these situations, for coping, economic uh, coping reasons, economic uh, 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 for basic survival, children are. This is a time of their utmost exploitation by people who wait for these moments to use children either in industries or. Um, agriculture, but also, uh, which has been a tremendous trend over the whole region, uh, African Arab countries and non-African Arab countries, children in, in um, used as child soldiers now, or children used in armed conflicts. But of course, it's not only as child soldiers, these children are held captive in very slave-like conditions, uh, in situations where they are guarding others, where they are seeking, um, they go to fetch uh, food for others under shelling, bombing, etc. Uh, and many other spying jobs even. Uh, and of course, they're given weapons And most of the time, not even trained on them fields. And we've seen many reports on that. Uh, many reports, uh, TV uh, reports, and uh, uh, even UN organizations, international NGOs. And in, all, in almost all the countries that have witnessed war, this has taken place and from all sides, uh, unfortunately. But the results are extremely dire on children. Uh, of course, the children who were used in the armed conflicts or in other forms of very, very um, difficult circumstances, uh, sexual exploitation, uh, construction, uh, of course, trafficking across borders, uh, for use in um, illegal, other illegal activities, uh, drug trafficking, other than the normal, very hazardous types of work. Now, what did this do to children? Uh, first of all, depression, uh, fear. Lots of children go back so traumatized. And this we don't see easily afterwards. We see the physical destruction of countries and towns and cities and and villages, but we don't see the human destruction, and um, especially of children. 
And how are these children going to grow? How, what do they think of their own selves, of the society that has left them, prey to uh, pred predators, actually, gangsters, mafias, they, and they, they call them contractors. So what does that mean, contractors? There are contractors that come and contract hundreds of children for different illicit activities. And the children live with this feeling of guilt and on the long term, a lot of men mental illnesses and definitely, or, or if not attended to, a lot of antisocial behavior. At society level, social exclusion, because there's a big gap between the way they live and other more privileged children live. And this will continue to create a deep inequality in society, a long-term frustration against others. And of course, you can never have peace while if these children are not properly attended to, rehabilitated, felt like they are children and, and um, given the things that children are given and reintegrated back into their families and into their societies. Uh, how does it affect the development and economy? There is no development. We cannot talk about development or economic development while we have another level of society crushed through child labor. And um, I see a, a lot of, you know, beautiful buildings in different countries, uh, beautiful uh, structure, infrastructure, but we have to always make sure that this is not at the expense of these marginalized people uh, and their families. Of course, we're also missing on a future generation of a skilled labor force and let alone further insecurity. You cannot have security without having uh, economic stability and economic, not only development, but fairness and fair distribution of any uh, income for the economy. Now, what are the preventive measures? For a long time, we have been talking about social protection. And we have to be careful that social protection is found in many forms. It's not only the, the stipend that is given through the government to marginalized families. We have to look at other innovative ways to reach people who are uh, in remote areas, in certain fields of the economy that are hard to reach sometimes, uh, and uh, on border areas, which are in many cases left out. And we have seen in the different um, displacement situations that the most affected by wars and those who, who move across borders are the ones in border areas of countries, of the whole development uh, programs of countries. Now in Egypt, there has been a very good example, which is called Takaful and Karama, which I, I would think many have heard about it, where the Ministry of uh, Social Solidarity uh, provides conditional ca cash transfers to marginalized areas uh, on the condition that uh, their children go to school. And they're given especially to those families who, where the mother is the breadwinner, where the, the father is um, disabled or, or uh, died, etc. There are other forms of preventive measures, and these are where they concentrate on schooling. Schooling in our region is so uh, non-child friendly. And uh, those who are Arabic speaking, with, you know, I call it so children, they push children, they, sorry, schools, they push children out of them or the schooling system or the educational system. So uh, there's another good example in Egypt and another from uh, Jordan where public schools have been, uh, uh, let's say, re rejuvenated 
or um, refurbished to be attractive for children in the way they look and also in their premises in terms of safety for girls and boys uh, and all kinds of safety, physical safety and social safety uh, of boys and girls, especially girls. And the KFW here in Egypt has provided a lot of fantastic examples in very, very rural areas. Uh, they are nicer than even private schools. But the important thing, and same with Madrasati in Jordan, but the, same, but the important thing here is that they've also worked on socially on the schools, on um, social behavior, on uh, uh, training teachers how to deal with children, to, uh, to uh, avoid, prevent school, early school dropout. As we know also, sometimes the teaching staff, the administration are not attentive to what a lot of marginalized children go through in their everyday life, and they're at risk of early school dropout and early entry into child labor. The ILO has had for a long time, which I've worked with also, uh, called the SCREAM program, amazing awareness raising programs uh, in the educational system through the arts and the media. And that's one of the best programs really that attracts children, attracts the community, and you can bring any subject onto stage, uh, acted by the children themselves, and it's not really acted because they feel this naturally. And sometimes in Lebanon, for example, we had the mothers uh, and the parents be with them uh, on stage, in drama, in singing, because they have also their uh, challenges with these children. So we should not forget the parents also. So social protection schemes are extremely important to stop to, or to limit child labor, especially in wars urgent economic, logistic, and nutritional support. And this cannot wait for long because once children go into work, it's very difficult to get them out of such work for many reasons. They are held captive in their, in their situations of refugee or displacement. And um, the, the recruiters uh, use them or, or hold them captives in many different ways. So we have to be careful about that, it, urgent support. Uh, we need uh, local committees that can monitor children before they go into uh, very hazardous and exploitative child labor or to uh, withdraw them from such work immediately before they are further exploited and where you cannot do that much afterwards with the exploitation that has been done and the harm that has been done. And monitoring is done by different levels in society. And in, in war times and post-war times, you have to include not the typical only labor inspectors and so on. You need general security across borders. You need the International Red Cross. You need the army in many cases because uh, to help you with those who have been used as child soldiers or who can go and, and be recruited on the other side as child soldiers, as well as health workers and social workers. Uh, now, withdrawal programs, rehabilitation programs, reintegration, there are a lot. And, and, and really, I know of a lot of programs that were not, that were not costly uh, and had a lot of effect. One of them has been uh, the Tahya Masr presidential initiative uh, in Egypt. And this is a very good example where there was a lot of political will from the president and it was um, implemented by the uh, social affairs ministry with NGOs on the ground specifically for street children. And why for street children? Because it has been proven in many of our countries, they are the first used in conflicts and armed conflicts and political protests and so on. And this is a very successful project. And you can see here the Maestro Sahab who established the National Choir in Egypt against child labor, and I'll explain this to you more. And we started it also in Lebanon with refugees. In Egypt, in Egypt it was with street children mainly, in Lebanon with Lebanese and with Syrian refugees and also Palestinian refugees. 
And this singing program is amazing for getting out all these horrors and fears that children feel and cannot express easily. Through singing, through music, a lot of tension uh, is, let's, is, is, goes out. And they are, they are loaded with tension that you can get out through music and through sports, let alone peace programs which have to be adapted and to children and at their own level. And we can discuss this more, what do we mean by peace programs? Now, the, the picture you see at the bottom, we established in Lebanon special child labor centers. And I found them of the most um, useful and most effective interventions because they have, uh, and I worked with several for establishing them and, and training the staff. And, and these ones you see there are established within the refugee community and provides comprehensive services for at-risk and working children. So they deal with the children, with a child, with the mother, with the siblings, and with the fathers where, where they uh, exist. And from them, they provide income generating projects, uh, training, uh, vocational training, self-protection for a lot of children, which gives them a lot of self-esteem like karate or judo, uh, just like singing does and just like sports does. And these centers are, are really, really effective. And I hope that you can visit them in future. I can give you more names and details. Now, uh, what's the role of local authorities in the uh, prevention and protection of uh, child labor, especially after wars? Uh, of course, um, they have to in ensure that we all have legislations for protection of children, but their enforcement needs to be very strict. And this has not been the case at all. And allow me to just reflect, in the times that we're going through now with the virus, yes, it is so bad and it's killing so much people. But let me tell you, that a lot of children are being killed every day or injured every day in a similar way and a very clear way, not through the virus, but through their employment and recruitment and extremely unsafe and slave-like conditions. And we have called for years for protection of these children, simple masks for those who can work and whose conditions can be made better. Gloves, uh, boots, and, and nobody has listened. It, it, it happens in some places for a short time, and then nobody cares. And I can see now how local authorities can enforce laws, because it's affecting everyone now. It's so visible, it's talked about so much that it's affecting high level people. Oh yes, we do enforce protection. But when it affects these poor kids who have no voice whatsoever, we talked in the media, but not much was happening as reinforcement. So authorities can do, local and national central authorities can do a lot with preventing this happening to children everywhere, in the streets, in industrial workshops, where their eyes are hurt every day, their lungs, cancer, uh, lead in their, in their uh, blood through, through uh, what they, what they uh, inhale, and a lot more, and a lot more. So we would like local authorities to help on this, let alone conflict resolution and peace programs after displacement and ends and after refugees go back to their homes. Now, uh, employers can help a lot, first by enforcing their code of conduct, pro prohibiting child labor, not only in, in the top level, but all the supply chains, uh, providing education and safe skills, training within sometimes factories. I've seen it, a small school is opened within factories 
I've seen it in garment factories, carpet factories in Egypt, where all the children are provided a, a safe school to work transition. Uh, public private partnerships can do a lot for child laborers and ex child soldiers and their families. And this is important for the future safety of our society and even for the economy. Micro credit, micro credit loans have, have done very well in places like Egypt, which are not easy and complicated and, and a huge population. Uh, sponsorships of companies for long term activities of children. I've seen sports activities being uh, sponsored, uh, even World Cups, where the, the, the Coca Cola sponsored a World Cup for street children from A to Z, the training that goes on until the World Cup comes, where there is a side uh, game for ch uh, marginalized children. And companies can also provide safety equipment. Uh, just like some companies now are producing extra masks and extra gloves, they can do the same for working children. And I urge them to do that. There's so much that they can do. And, and it will also benefit their own companies. And this, this is a long you know, story that we can discuss always more. Uh, what's the role of funding agencies? Funding agencies have now, uh, and development agencies, uh, have all committed uh, and UN agencies for eliminating child labor, worst forms of child labor and uh, children used as child soldiers and uh, enforced labor forms uh, through the SDG 8.7 uh, by 2025. Now, I don't know what will happen after the, the natural disaster that we are in. So extra efforts have to come into that uh, now and after the disaster. Uh, support child labor centers. And this is one of the, the most economically efficient things that funding agencies can do. Uh, we have excellent practices in Lebanon and some in Jordan, as, as I know from colleagues and experiences, where the, the, the service is not scattered. It's provided in one place in a very coordinated manner. And also supporting communal and remote educational programs for school dropouts, especially girls. And now we are seeing there are many ways of remote learning and uh, we can do it anywhere. And I've seen it happen anywhere, even inside tents, inside destroyed areas, inside unsafe areas, and now we're experiencing it with a lot of kids uh, who are all uh, locked up at home. And I would urge also development agencies to support music and sports program programs. They are the best therapeutic programs and rehabilitation programs for children and ex-child soldiers and those affected by armed conflicts in addition to other rehabilitation measures. Last but not least, from my experience, nobody can um, stop child labor alone. Neither the government, nor uh, UN agencies, nor NGOs, nor companies. It needs a united effort uh, because it happens along a, a whole chain from the field level up to uh, national authorities and to employers. Uh, thank you very much um, for your attention and um, this topic is very dear to my heart. I've been on it 20 years without um, stopping uh, and um, I'm ready to, to listen to your questions uh, and hope I can be of uh, any help in my responses. Thank you Dr. Hayat. Uh, do you hear me? That's right? Yes, I hear you. Okay. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. Uh, doctor, thank you, Dr. Hayat, for, your, uh, for the very interesting uh, uh, topic and the presentation. Uh, you have brought uh, expertise and experiences from um, different, uh, from Egypt, from uh, Jordan, similar, uh, which, which is very interesting for our audience to learn about and to, that supports them, their projects, in enhancing the design, project designs for, uh, for projects that, uh, that 
combat uh, and uh, fight child labor. Uh, like Madrasti, Takafal Karama, the conditional cash program in Egypt, Madrasti in Jordan with Queen Rania, I think the sponsor of that uh, initiative. Uh, thank you very much for that experience. You have a great experience with the ILO, years of ILO experience, and uh, thank you so much. L let, me, uh, let me ask uh, attendees, uh, audience, to write their questions. So, uh, Dr. Hayat can uh, read loudly the question and hopefully she can answer these questions as well. So, if you have any question, please write it now. We'll wait for uh, one minute. So, we start writing your questions. So, Dr. there is a question, Dr. Hayat. Do you see it? Um, okay, where do I now click to see the question? On the chat. The, the, questions, chat. the question says, thanks for a very interesting presentation. How do you think the current pandemic would affect child labor in our region and beyond? Oh, I'm, I'm extremely worried. I'm extremely worried now. Nobody is seeing this at the moment. But as the, the storm calms down with the huge um, economic uh, situation that will be left in for adults, knowing for a long time how employers think, they will think of children as their first coping mechanism with the economic situation. And this must be stopped uh, immediately because... Um, First of all, we, we should know that child labor is one of the reasons for adult unemployment. And uh, here we have to work hard with employers and the state for reinforcing laws for child labor uh, through awareness raising programs, just like what's happening now with Corona. But it's, it's now only affecting top level people in addition, of course, to the whole society that they are moving. We must not allow it to happen again and more. After Corona, I expect this is the first coping mechanism for probably states and employers. Uh, so a lot of awareness raising programs through local NGOs, through uh, development agencies, through state authorities, whoever has uh, links to the state from your audience. Uh, this is my great fear because it's always a result of conflict uh, other than the, the normal child labor uh, for economic reasons, the normal economic reasons, but it also comes after natural uh, disasters. And we have to really watch out for it now. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hayat. Uh, I'm afraid that I'm not sure if, uh, Dr. Hayat, you agree with me, maybe funding agencies, funding priorities will be much less now on the child labor projects because of this corona pandemic. Is this right? Would this, would the funding will be less uh, or the SDG 8.7 or the uh, focus on child labor will be less than before? Uh, well, uh, definitely. It, you know, as we can see, it took, it took attention away from uh, a lot of major uh, topics, but you know, it's very much like uh, when you are going through a war, uh, it's, a, it's a like a war now. So you don't see the after effects until this war is over. Uh, so countries need to be, countries and communities need to be ready for after this war. Uh, <laughs> some wars have gone on for years. I don't expect this one to be like this. Uh, but if we are not ready for after the war, we could end up with other kinds of disasters, human disasters. And really the first issue that would come to my mind is a social explosion, social, political, and economic explosion. So you finish from Corona, if you don't hold it, hold the community together quickly, 
then you can go to another kind of explosion. Just like yeah. after a war, you cannot have peace after a war without those who have been so hurt, they're not rehabilitated. And those who will be very hurt after this war are the most marginalized, like after every war. Because those at the top are able to protect themselves better in different ways. It's just like war. And those at the bottom are crushed further. So please watch out for the, those who are crushed further. They okay. will explode. Perfect. Uh, another question from Maryam Sabra. She said, I live in Lebanon, and honestly, child labor is still ongoing and seen every day. If the program exists in one specific area, uh, I don't know which program, if, a pro if the program exists in one specific area, how will it help other places across Lebanon? Okay. I mean, the program, yeah, you maybe have just mentioned the pro program about in Lebanon, this, this project. The street children program I was talking about, which is, I find it a very good um, example, you know, to take was the one of Egypt. And uh, I'll be very honest with you, Mariam, uh, the one in Egypt, with, which I have worked with, uh, works at several levels. As I was saying, it's a presidential initiative, meaning it has a, a polit strong political will. Uh, and as we can see in Corona also, you need a strong political will and then it trickles down, and then you go to the ministry level. Uh, the program is done, funded by the President Tahya Masar uh, Fund and other funding agencies. It's implemented by the ministry. The plan is put by the ministry for street children and implemented by the ministry and NGOs on the ground. So for Lebanon, uh, I know, of course, Lebanon very well in its ministries, in its NGOs, and um, we can, you know, always talk about this more because it needs a lot of time. But the Ministry of Social Affairs has a program in Lebanon for street children. And uh, this needs to be discussed. And of course, I, I, you know, I can give you the names uh, later on. Discussed with them. And um, I can provide you links to them. It has to have a strong political will. And we're seeing this now with, with Corona. I always said that. I even did, let me tell you something, Mariam, my PhD was the title of it, The Effect of Politics on Child Labor in Lebanon, specifically. Because from my experience there, when you have a strong political will, it trickles down. Because the NGOs know how to work. They know how to work very well. And I know the Lebanese experience. There's a lot of quality work on the ground and one of the best in the regions. So you need both to go together to have maximum impact. Just like we're seeing now, it's a very good example. So, you know, I can give you more um, details on that. Okay, you can, you, can, you, can, you can connect uh, with Miriam Sabra. After the, uh, the, the yes, webinar, sure. we will share with you, uh, Dr. Hayat, all the names who has participated in this uh, webinar. So you can uh, further discuss this more. There is another question coming from Algeria. And she, uh, uh, the lady name. Uh, her name is Zainab. She's, uh, she's asking, I'm from Algeria and head of a child's voice NGO. She's okay. a head of an NGO. And she, she says, how can we participate? How an NGO can participate into combating child labor? Well, what's nice is the, the name of your NGO, uh, Child Voice. I love that because I am so tired of everything happening over the child's head. So policies, legislations, the people who talk to each other, even sometimes, you know, UN agencies, you see huge conferences and so on. It's all on top of the child's head. So I always say, where is the child's voice in all this? So even the programs that you develop, many at times they're not effective because they don't meet the child's psyche or needs or context that they're in. You have to, now how can you put the dry, child's voice? I will share with you the SCREAM program. The SCREAM program is an amazing program, which raises the child's voice uh, through singing, through drama. We had excellent experiences uh, through poetry, journalism, 
we had we had even online journalism clubs between uh, refugee communities. Uh, so across Lebanon, like those are from the south and those in, in the Hello. north, uh, and so Hello. on. Abudi. Uh, sorry, and so. Um, uh, Yes, uh, Scream is a very good program for that. Uh, through drawing, uh, we can also discuss that further because it's, it's a lot big program. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to, it has to address community members, policy makers, just like the one I mentioned about the Sahab, Maestro Sahab. Yes. It's an amazing choir in Egypt that consists of street children. And believe me, no matter how much we talk, to policymakers about, let's say, street children or child labor, when they come and hear the voices of the talented children amongst them, with a famous conductor as Maestro Salim Sahab, uh, he's by the way Lebanese Egyptian, uh, they are, they listen. They listen to the children's voices. Yes. But you have to uh, know how to present it. Perfect. And she, as she's asking more uh, Zainab from Algeria. She said uh, as well, uh, because she said in Algeria, no one wants to speak about child labor, even the ILO. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, okay, now I'm, I'm a consultant. You know, I consult for the ILO, but I'm not ILO, so I'm an independent consultant. Yes. But I can tell you, um, yes, okay, it's a responsibility of international organizations, UN organizations. I, I agree with you there. And I, and I know though, that in Algeria, there isn't at the moment a strong uh, program for the ILO for child labor. Uh, but, you know, why do we have to always wait for international NGOs? We as countries, I strongly believe that, we as countries have to and as governments and as uh, civil society organizations talk for our own children. And we ask others to come on board and support, but we have to know what we want for our children. Uh, I'm, let me put it this way, because what happens is that when we highly depend on international organizations, to do something, we can find ourselves left alone after they leave. And look at what's happening now, also with Corona. Countries are doing a lot within themselves and getting, they have their own plans and getting donations and funds and support based on their contextual and national plans. Of course, with support of other international experiences, NGOs, uh, UN agencies, uh, experts, you know, now we have health experts. So, uh, but you have to have your own plan and then ask others to help in it. Perfect. But we, we need to have our plan for our children. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, another question. Uh, uh, thank you so much. How do you how do you usually respond to refugee children who voluntarily want to work and drop out from school in order to respond to the economic needs of their families? Yeah, uh, of course. Um, I always say that we have to be very careful. Uh, awareness raising is a very important thing. We underestimate it. But I liked very much the experiences of the child labor centers. Why? Because you can offer refugees, you're first of all amongst them. This is a very important issue where you um, raise confidence between you as an organization and their families and their communities. And why you raise, you raise this confidence in different services, immunization, social services, health services, and amongst it, child labor. So giving a comprehensive package with child labor is more successful. I cannot just go and just tell them to stop their children working 
without providing other kind of reinforcing support. And the child labor centers, I mean, uh, I go and spend so much time in them and I see what happens. I'm an, I'm an anthropologist by the uh, way, by, by training. So I observe a lot of the relationships. Um, parents do listen to you when they start to trust you. Uh, but you have to have other supporting services. You cannot just stop them without them being able to get any medicine, without them being able to get any food. I'm not saying to provide all this, but you can coordinate some of this to for them to access while stopping child labor. Uh, and I explain, yeah, yes, okay. sorry. Uh, I think and you're explaining right. Explaining, especially, esp especially explaining to their mothers. The mothers get so affected when you show them what happens to their girls, what happens to their boys. Uh, I found working with mothers extremely effective and, um, and I was affected by it. Uh, we had sometimes mothers, we took them to see their children from far away. They didn't expect that. I cannot say all stop them from work? No. But at least 30 to 40% could not take what, you know, in, in Lebanon, because it's called the shawish, the contractor of the children. The way he would beat them, he would humiliate them, uh, slave-like conditions. So there are different ways that you can raise the awareness of parents, especially, and provide child protection means for the child not to be exploited and give other, other uh, child-friendly environments within the safe space of, the, of a center. Perfect. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, for the issue of refugees as well, Dr. Hayat, uh, uh, as you said, it's a comprehensive package to support the resilience of refugee families in which yeah. they can uh, and awareness as well, in which they can see education is part of their resilience. Yes. And, uh, and uh, there, are, there are so many uh, projects uh, supporting education for uh, child children, uh, like U European Union MEDAD program. And there is also the, a very nice platform, which is called, managed by UNICEF and a number of international NGOs called ACTED, World Vision, CARE, and the platform is called yes. No Lost Generation. You can easily, yes. uh, everyone here can easily Google it, No Lost uh, Generation, and then you find a lot of resources and, and a lot of uh, uh, work opportunities in which everyone can, can try to find a way to help uh, the children around him, either refugees or uh, exploited or uh, uh, child labor uh, who uh, misses, who miss their education. There's a third question here. How, Dr. Hayat, how would you assess community effectiveness of a child labor control programs in our region? Okay, community effectiveness? Yes, of um, the child labor control programs. This comes from Ahmed Mandil. Okay, um, well, uh, local authorities like the municipalities, and I worked a lot with municipalities, and um, they can be of the most effective, more than ministries in many cases, at the grassroots level. Why? Because municipalities, um, we had lots of monitoring committees at the level of the municipality. The municipality in many countries has a lot of a social authority, socio-educational authority. Let me give you an example. Part of the bylaws uh, of municipalities in Lebanon, for example. Uh, I used to look through the bylaws and see what is their role. Part of the role, which... in Syria before the war. I worked in Syria before 
for the war. And um, okay, we look after school. So the municipality stops them from nine to, to, to one or two, whatever, and they go out. At least they're getting educated. And this is very important because it, it gives them another chance in life. If they're not educated, they, they have missed a huge chance to change the path of their lives. So law reinforcement at communal level is very important. And monitoring of child labor, that's the most important, actually. Okay. It's done by local authorities and NGOs. Perfect. There's another the th last question uh, because we need to, uh, it's, uh, we are going uh, uh, approaching one hour, uh, 10 minutes to one hour. So uh, the question is, do you feel that sustainable development goals have had a positive impact on refugees? Why do you think refugees were not mentioned as a sustainable development goal on their own? Uh, How can people bolster the SDGs to include more refugee-specific targets? The question comes from Crystal Barakat. Uh, this is a very um, good question also. Uh, uh, there was nothing specific for, for refugees. And um, most, most exploitative situations are not only amongst, let me uh, clarify this, amongst refugees, which are displaced in you know, other countries, but also amongst internally displaced. And internally displaced face very similar uh, situations, especially in big countries, uh, like in Africa, African countries. Um, now, but, but yes, this is, I, I always turn my mind, by the way, that they're not mentioned, refugees are not mentioned. Uh, and some explain that when a country says, I want to child labor in my country, let's say in Lebanon or Egypt or Syria or whatever, uh, according to internal regulations and the Child Rights Convention, which most countries have signed, this includes all children on their ground. So, however, this is, a, I'll also give you Lebanon as an example, or even Jordan. Yes, all children on Lebanese grounds, but including refugees. But in these situations, as in Lebanon, you're talking about a third of Lebanon's population are uh, any country cannot deal with a third of its population uh, and, you know, already have their own problems. And same with Jordan. Jordan also has a very huge number of uh, refugees in terms of its own population. Yes. So these countries, um, no, there were any like this. I'm sad not the refugees and the SDGs as they are the, uh, uh, the highest proportions, the most exploited. Yes, it's, uh, it's uh, refugees can maybe under the category of vulnerable children of vulnerable population. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, um, uh, by the end today, I uh, know that uh, I would like uh, to thank you, Dr. Hayat, for this uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, as Derby, the Development Assistance Roadmap Portal of, in the Middle East, we are, uh, we are happy to host such webinars and encourage everyone attending, actually, to create partnerships and to connect and engage with each other and as well as with internationalizations. There are, there are so many emerging organizations working on a child labor. An important thing at the moment is to have a good welfare for the citizens of the Arab region. Come up with your ideas with these uh, successful lessons, as Dr. Hayat just a few of them. 
and uh, uh, and design it in a in a nicely uh, project methodology or uh, deliver with with right mechanisms and uh, potential impacts and work with those organizations together so you can get the funding necessarily as well as uh, as well so partnership and communicate uh thank you dr hayat again very much and as we promised we will send you that all the emails or the people who have attended today and we'll send you the questions as well so and then after that you can easily connect with uh, those attended including ahmed nandil maryam sabara sabra crystal barakat and i, I don't want to mention all the names but uh, thank you very much again and all the best I would like to thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ala, for all your support uh, in the whole journey uh, to reaching out to everyone. And your role was very important and the role of DARPI. Uh, and I'm very happy to find such uh, linking organizations in the MENA region. Yes. Um, and I strongly really would like others to continue this uh, platform yes. through you also because we need a platform like this. Exactly. Thank you very much for all your support. Thank you very much. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.